where I stole it from, so you cannot trace this back as to where the, I'll have to look at that again. Uh, where I, uh, so, in my records I have uh, got it. Anyway, what you see here is this part tells you about the distribution of dark energy. Yeah, that's what you see here. And then you can independently get, figure out from these fits that we did here, yeah, like fits to, now the green is a fit and the red are the data points with very high precision. From these fits you can figure out how much baryonic matter, omega b, and omega dark matter, how much dark matter you need. And then you put all of this in to figure out how the universe is put together. And <laughs> a really nice corollary there is that at the South Pole there is a, a, a infrared telescope that can measure even much further out than Planck. Why is Planck limited? Because of the angular scale again. Yeah. Um, your pixel size determines how much resolution you have. Yeah. If you sit on the ground and look in the infrared band, then you can, with a, with a big mirror, you can have higher angular resolution. They don't look at the whole sky anymore, but they only, for angular correlation on small scales, you only need a small area. And so they, this is from WMAP, I think like probably a uh, plank goes out to here, we can call the wiggles, you can count the wiggles in your spare time, because we have to move here. The other thing, why I really put this up, and I figured this out for one of the lectures I gave, because the fascinating thing is, you make the wrong prediction here if you do not fold into your fit, your simulation that lies under your fit, the weak lensing effects. Yeah. If you do not account for weak lensing in the known galaxy distribution, you get the wrong answer here. Yeah, your, your fit is not on the data point. Fascinating, isn't it? Okay, but the last really thing that I want to talk about when I motivation for dark matter or why do we believe that dark matter is there, why do I spend my time hunting it, is actually the abundance of the elements in the universe. The stuff that we are made of, that stars are made of, that stars are processing to give the carbon that makes organic matter. Yeah. Where does this come from? This comes from physics that we know, strong interactions. Yeah, you put things together, you freeze out, when, when this cools, at some point you get nuclei, you get protons and neutrons. They come together into uh, atoms, into nuclei. And in fact, in the beginning, you don't have anything heavier than very, very little beryllium-8 but essentially lithium-7, that's where it stops. Yeah. You have a couple of beryllium -8. that's all that's there. Everything else is co comes from the death of stars, yeah. First from the burning and then the death of stars. And we can measure how much stuff is out there. Again, as a function of redshift, you look into the oldest objects, yeah. you look at what is there, and you have to have a certain relative abundance of baryonic matter and dark matter. If you have baryonic dark matter, so dark matter that interacts with the matter that makes the substance that we are made from, you don't get the right answer. You get a different distribution. And why does dark energy not play any role in this, because dark energy is a recent newcomer to the history. Yeah? It really, in the beginning, dark energy, in the beginning of the universe, doesn't play a role. It's essentially, because space is also so limited in itself. Right? 
dark matter sets on and exponentially increases its influence now. But that is recent on the scale of the evolution of the universe. Now. And so here, again, it's necessary to have the right amount of baryonic energy, which means of the whole here, if you turn this around, this argument, you need that much baryonic energy, energy uh, matter in your matter component to the beginning of the universe. It, of course, means that 95%, the rest needs to be something else, that stuff that we call dark matter. OK. So here is the famous, like for many years I saw this, you don't see this much anymore, like the original uh, dark matter. So here are the standard parameters from, I guess, at this point, oh yeah, 2011. So I, I should have pulled out the newest numbers from the latest uh, particle data group. But if you, that you can do yourself, yeah, and do it. Go to the particle data group, look at this. This is really interesting stuff, and you will find a lot of background information there of how all this So now, what do we know about dark matter? Uh, dark matter? Well, we know it in the experimentation. It shapes the universe. It's collisionless, and I haven't shown you this bullet uh, cluster picture of like two galaxies that collided some time back, and now you can look at the distribution of gas, which does collide, yeah, like you can, the gas pressure presses, and you can dictate two hair blowers and point them at each other. That will lead to the gas having to escape to the side. So gas cannot go through each other. But the dark matter, which essentially we picture as a gas of particles, poof, just goes through each other. So it doesn't interact, like because it's no inter inter uh, uh, electromagnetic interaction. Yeah. It shapes the galaxies, it shapes the universe, and determines, determines that we, uh, uh, what matter is available to build the likes of us. Of course, it not needs to be living these particles, if it's particles, which we believe that it is, dark, these dark matter particles, need to have a lifetime that is longer than the age of the universe, because it still is there. The rotation curves of, for example, the Milky Way is measured now. Yeah? And of the nearby galaxies, a couple of years ago, like or tens of years or plenty, well, that's the closest. Uh, how many light years is that away? Uh, the large Magellanic cloud. I should know this, and I don't. So, look it up. <laughs> yeah, but that's. I mean, we we know it's right now. Dark matter is there. So these particles have not decayed, and actually, in all these simulations, they are stable. Yeah. There's no varying content of decay. So they live longer than the universe. Right. Essentially, for, for, for the proportion, for the fraction of that kind of matter to the total of, of matter not changing, and us measuring that protons are stable for all we know, yeah. I super come you come there to start with is a proton decay experiment. And we know it's now about 10 to the 33 years or so for the most uh, decay channels. Yeah. We have not found proton decay which some of our theoretical colleagues tell us, yeah, yeah, but my theory says it must decay, so you must find it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, now, theorists, yeah? So we have all these problems. We have dark matter there, nobody knows what it is, which means there should be particles that are not in our standard model scheme of things. So how do you extend this? What how do you find a better theory? Well, you have to look at what is possibly wrong with the theory that you know. And the things that theorists think are, are, are wrong are uh, listed here. Yeah. So the gauge hierarchy problem means that like the weak scale 
is sitting there somewhere where there's no natural, where we don't think there's any natural motivation for it to sit at this particular level. Yeah? It should either be at the Kaplan scale or really down to Earth, and it's not. It's sitting somewhere in between. Then now you can throw in some new physics, and then you get new flavors, and then you get new quantum numbers. So everything gets more complicated. So you can fix this by complicating things, but that's not pretty. Yeah, that is like adding AP cycles to your warp theory of gravitation, which is that uh, planets uh, move uh, around the sun, uh, everything moves around the sun in a, in a certain manner. Okay, so here is a brave theorist who made like checklists like what can you do with certain things and here is the most favorite theory up to, well, up to lab one. Yeah. WIMPs. Supersymmetric uh, WIMPs, the, the um, uh, LSP, the uh, lightest supersymmetric particle would be the WIMP. And you could have a universe where the gauge hierarchy problem is solved with a minimal extension of new particles, only the superpartners for what we know. Um, this has come under pressure from LHC run one already because right now these super particles have to be so heavy that they cannot explain either. So if it's just the super particles, you cannot explain the uh, gauge hierarchy problem away anymore. So, or you have, so you have to throw in new particles and then the parsimony, the simplicity that, that you don't add new problems by adding new particles, that you now have to find a motivation for not just like a mirror image of the world that we know. This is getting under pressure. Why did people really believe that WIMPs is the answer because of this WIMP miracle if you do this calculation, if you start up with a very hot soup in the Big Bang and cool it, temperature going down, you cool it as it expands, like you, yeah, like your gas does in stars and whatnot, time evolves, you would, as it gets less and less dense, you would stop always in every collision to produce an annihilate in equal amounts, yeah, and you would settle on an equilibrium which, if you put in a weak scale cross section, so the cross section that we know from the weak uh, interaction, you would get the right energy density for the universe in dark matter. It's like, oh, so we can solve the gauge hierarchy problem with this minimal supersymmetry. We get the right energy density for dark matter. That must be the solution. Now LHC tells us, no, you don't get all of this at the same time. But we built all these detectors. So now the problem for us experimentalists, people like me, is what do you build? You want to find, we, we need to find out what dark matter is, one way or another. Yeah. And so one way is to, to, to train your telescopes or gamma ray detectors at the universe and hope that if they have an interaction with normal matter, then photons come out and you see these photons. So indirect detection. It's a whole industry. And you've all heard about uh, AMS, uh, the, the alpha spectrometer on the, on the International Space Station and its positron excess or positron whatnot. You've heard about the Fermi excess from the center in gamma rays from the center of the galaxy or so. But nobody really knows how to connect that back. So if we can do it in our lab, if we can find these, these particles bouncing into something in our lab, that's what we do underground. Yeah? And there are many, many ways of going about this. And I really need to spend up to speed up. Now, the point here is the signals are KeV scale. Kilo electron volt is the energy deposit if and only if a dark matter particle has any other interaction gravitational. Gravitational interaction does not play a role in any kind of experiment we can do. We 
ignore it completely when we build accelerators like LAP. Uh, probably somebody may raise a hand and I'll, I'll comment on this. Uh, uh, there's a title for us that graphs the earthing. So yes, it does play a role, but this is something we found out after and it has nothing to do with gravity interacting with the beam or anything. Yeah, it's the, you know, uh, it doesn't play a role. But down there, you have so much radioactivity. Everything, every radioactive decay, however small it is, will give you a signal. And <clears throat> you have cosmic ray muons. As we sit here, we are irradiated constantly by cosmic ray muons that come from interactions of cosmic ray particles plunging into the atmosphere, interacting with particles, making cascades of showers, and as the pions in the early stages of this cascade decay, the muons plow through us. And they follow us underground. These are all underground sites. All this research is done underground. And you have to get away. Why? Because, for example, if you take copper, which is one of the purest, radio pure, very radio pure materials, you prepare it above ground and let it sit here, the muons will zip through there and will rip apart copper nuclei in your copper block. And by the time, like five weeks later, when you come back from your summer vacation, you take your copper block and take it underground, it's radioactive. It's not copper anymore because the muons did their work throughout its volume. Yeah. So you need to prepare it and immediately ship it underground. And even underground, you still have muons following you and doing the same mischief. And then, of course, underground, you have a lot of uranium and stuff and, and radon seeping out of the rock. Yeah, I need to get to part two, X mass. So we want to do this. We want to find dark matter particles. Yeah. And we actually, at some point, want to measure uh, neutrinos again, too. And so there are many ways to explain the name Ultimately, we want a 10-ton fiducial volume, 24-ton total detector, and then we will have, xenon has one isotope that is a candidate for neutrino-less double beta decay, and we want to measure that. Um, we want to find the WIMPs, but ultimately we will be limited by solar neutrino interactions, which down bump into our detector. So here is the collaboration. You can peruse this from the PDF. Here is where we are. This is Tokyo. This is Nagoya. And if you go straight up north, this is Toyama, where I live. And from there, I drive 30 kilometers, 35 kilometers into the mountains every day to go into the mine. And uh, if somebody comes over there, Tell me out front, and I'll take you into this lab. Where in the lab you will find this detector. You will, like me, like this lady, stand on top. You will not see the detector. It has to be light tight. It has to be shielded from radioactivity. Super K, I can take you into Super K. You'll stand on top of it, and unlike me, never see the inside because no light can go in, and if you can look in and see <coughs> light coming to your eye, then it means light can also go in. So here we have 642 photomultipliers all looking in, and this is filled with uh, liquid xenon. Now, we underground, so the muons are relatively, they are relatively safe from, also they still follow us there, but you are underground, you're shielded from them because you have a lot of rock around you. Now, rock is radioactive. Yeah, there's uranium and everything in there. Neutrons coming out. A neutron is a neutral particle that can enter your detector without producing scintillation light and bump into a nucleus and make a nuclear recoil. And since this is scintillation light that we look for in our detector, it's isotropic. So we do not see where the bump came from. Yeah. So we would not see any preferential direction or could discriminate background which comes uniformly from all sides from a signal 
that preferably comes not from one side, like us plowing as the Earth moves through the dark matter halo sitting there. Yeah. Uh, hi. Yeah. The liquid genome uh, simulates at 178. That's right. Yes, nanometers. These, these, these PMPs are. Do you wavelength shift? Or no, do we do not wavelength shift. For a long time, people have figured, tried to figure out how to wavelength shift because PMTs couldn't do that. The modern PMTs can do it, and we actually do have the. Uh, so the most uh, expensive PMT. Three thousand dollar a pop. Yes. <laughs> also because the. Uh, uh, but the, the real trick is because the wavelength is so short, it took us a while to figure out. Most of the time, with twenty, with with ten percent of the photons that we detect, actually deliver two photoelectrons per one photon at that wavelength because the energy of the of the photon is so high. Yeah. So here is pictures. Yeah, and you see. In order to keep this clean, when you construct, so you bring your copper underground. Everything is underground, everything is safe from radiation. But now you work in an environment where radon seeps out of the walls. The radon decays in the air, and the radioactive decay products then settle onto the surface of your detector. So you switch on your detector, your <coughs> scintillation light is it's glowing in the dark. So we have to bring in air from the outside. We have to work in very tight, controlled places where air goes into, clean air goes into the innermost sanctum, yeah, and everything is shielding to the outside. So we have a clean room in a clean room. In the clean room, that is the whole experimental area, which is lined with radon permeability. Yeah. So we change clothes. We change into clean room clothes before we enter the hall. We change into different clean room clothes before we enter the tank when we construct this. Yeah. In, in order to reduce background, then we are still not, uh, not quite there. Right? So this is all, this is, this is pictures, this is, I should go through. Electronics, of course, you need. Uh, this is calibration, this is extremely important. Actually, our single phase detector, because we have no, no, uh, um, electric field in there, and A, it can be constructed relatively simply, and B, we can lower a source into there on a rod without disturbing the field and measure along this axis, yeah, the, the, this thing here, and this is actually very, very small. Why? Because in the xenon is so dense, so heavy, that gammas don't go far, yeah, and so if you have a thick radioactive source and it it doesn't go far, then you get shadowing from this needle. So make it thin and hope that your gamma goes a couple of millimeters at least, or centi the, 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 the cobalt 57 has centimeter range, about like less, a little less than a centimeter. No? See, the uh, iron 55 source, the lowest energy source that we have, only has like a couple of, of micrometer range. Yeah? So then this needle becomes really big. And shadowing plays a role. What, Here is, yeah. what is the range? The energy you try to be linear? What is the range in KV energy? Oh, where we try to measure? Yeah, yeah we have actually, our detector is phenomenal inside because we have so many we have so good phototubes, and we have so many phototubes really looking from all sides that we get 14 photoelectrons. That must be a word photo record, so because it is. It I is. don't know anything yeah. better than 10. <laughs> but so we can go the lowest in energy. Not that it helps us much right now, because we have backgrounds there. Yeah. But in the future, now that we learned how to move forward, that will be, what am I doing? Am I going in the wrong direction? Uh, so, yeah. So, here is the history, we constructed it, we commissioned it. Now, we have one problem that we didn't know about. Everything, we are building new photomultipliers with Hamamatsu right now. Yeah. And we, like at that time, we test every material 
that they use. And if we don't like it, we ask them, what are the ingredients? And then we test the ingredients. We buy ingredients from various sources. We test them and select, use these ingredients to do this. Yeah? One thing we did not check because it's so little. There's a little aluminum here around to seal this. And it turns out that this was a fatal flaw because this is exposed directly to the detector to the inside. And so the radioactivity, the beta rays in here coming out of this, beta rays are particularly dangerous because electrons get wiggled around constantly. So if they are in a surface or in a material close to the, the simulation light, a lot of the energy, even if it's a, a 2 MeV beta decay, yeah, then at the very end or at the very beginning, the electron comes into the xenon a little bit, gets scattered back, dives into the invisible part, and deposits a couple of keV, exactly the amount of energy we expect for the signal, in your detector. And you, you know nothing about what is there, unless you can reconstruct it very well, which we figured out we have a slight problem with, and um, so we got better. So we refurbished, so here you see, this is just this thing sitting in a hole. Now we covered this, actually we did more, we, we really also locked in the seal, which is the radioactive part, yeah? we locked it in with copper and then put a plate across so that no light would come out of the slit. <coughs> this is what you see here, this, this cover plate, and you see the M1 screws that hold it in place. Yeah? This was our refurbishment, and you see this got the background down by, by a factor of 10, yeah? But we still have these radioactive phototubes in there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, but overall, we are really, really good in terms even of background, yeah? Okay, so, but light winds, we can measure because they had very low energies. If you have heavy winds, you can go, you can get a signal at higher energies. These are keV, 10 keV, 15 keV. Yeah? Light winds, you only get at very low energies. But we can measure this because we have this light yield that you talked about. Because we have so much light, we can go down and we can go there. And uh, this is what we did in our, before we repaired the detector. Now, recently, we were looking into a very specific problem, Dama Libra, a sodium iodide experiment, since 14 years measures this and now has a 3.9 sigma signal annual modulation. This you expect, and it has the right phase for this to be the Earth going around the sun in this halo, <coughs> it is sitting still sitting halo of dark matter in the galaxy. Yeah. So the idea is that, that dark matter just sits and the galaxy, the stars whirl around in it yeah. and then we whirl around and so you have slightly, this is all classical, these are very low energy collisions, so this is all classical mechanics, yeah, bowling ball mechanics that this is calculated with and it's perfectly adequate. Of course, the cross-sections is, is, is heavy uh, quantum field theory. No? So you, here you, you measure this, and you would expect this. And nobody else sees any signal. And so we go after this, and we just, uh, uh, I just have the proofs on my computer, and I should be going through them, but I'm talking here. Uh, 48 hours, so this will come out in PLB in the next days. It's, it's already on the archives, yeah. Um, one problem that we have is we have to prove that our light yield is stable. And actually it is. But a year, uh, two years ago I would have given this talk and I would have told you with good consciousness that our detector is beautiful because it is absolutely stable. Nothing ever changes in there. It's, uh, <laughs> okay, um, I'll try to be fast. Yeah, so we didn't even have to clean the xenon. And so this year, we, <coughs> the refrigerating units have to be, after running for a long time, after running for a 